Well, welcome. How's everybody on this cold, bleak day? <laughs> but spring's around the corner. I am ever, ho I, those, of, those folks who um, know me know that I am ever, I am ever hopeful. And um, I am very excited about maybe some 60 degree weather this weekend. Um, my name's Lisa German. I'm the university librarian and dean of library. And I am so glad that you could come together in person as well as online. So thank you for being with us. Um, National Poetry Month has arrived, which is a great reason to celebrate. And this is our 14th annual Pancake Poetry reading that honors Marcia Pancake, a retired librarian who loves poetry and sponsored poetry readings while at the libraries. This program is now overseen by librarian Malika Grant uh, from our Arts, Humanities, and Area Studies Department, or AHAS as we call it. And thank you so much, Malika. Thank you so much, Marcia. Marcia, thank you. So today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Sun Young Sin, a daring poet and cultural worker. In her recent collection of poetry, The Wet Hex, Shin embraces the traditions of Korea, where she was born, melding them with a heartbreaking view of our American present. Many of you, I hope, know one or more of the books she has edited, such as A Good Time for the Truth, race in Minnesota. She is also co-director of our local community organization, Poetry Asylum. Their mission statement includes, we want to build networks around the idea that poetry is egalitarian, humanistic, and political. In a nutshell, poetry to the people, for the people, by the people. Now I'd like to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we meet. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built upon the traditional ha homelands of the Dakota people. It's important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. But we know that words are not enough and we must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs to increase access to all aspects of higher education for American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. So now please join me in welcoming Sun Young Shin. everybody oh, it's so good to see you um, thank you for coming out for poetry happy National Poetry Month uh, thank you Lisa and thank you to Marcia Pancake this is incredible um, to dedicate space and time and resources to poetry in our culture um, it's nothing that I ever take for granted um, I want to start with a poem from I think it's a poem of the day um, from the Academy of American Poets. And it's, it's a short poem um, by the poet Marwa Halal. Okay, it's called, and then the, title, the poem just goes in from the title. The poem is a dream telling you it's time by Marwa Halal. The poem is a dream telling you it's time is a field as long as the butterflies say it is a field with their flight. It takes a long time to see like light or sound or language to arrive and keep arriving. We have more than six sense dialect and I am still adjusting to time, the distance and its permanence. I have found my shortcuts and landmarks to place where I first took form in the field. So that's by Marwa Halal. I, I really like her work. Um, and 
I guess, you know, a lot of times at readings, if people choke up or tear up or, you know, they'll apologize. And I always say, especially if I'm teaching and it's my students, like, don't apologize. Like, it's not a poetry reading or a poetry workshop unless, you know, someone's crying. And so I, I won't apologize for my puffy crying face, but I've been crying. Um, one of our dear beloved pets in our household is passing on today at six o'clock um, in the comfort of uh, our own home and her human, um, but it happened very suddenly. And so um, I, yeah, that's also why I didn't get here in a timely fashion. I was just kind of in the, um, in the chasm and saying goodbye and managing my dog that we have two dogs. So anyway, just sparing a thought for um, our earthly friend Sybil as she transitions um, to the ancestral plane, beautiful um, being. So thank you for coming for poetry. Um, so Poetry Asylum, we've been a little bit more sleepy since the pandemic. Um, we used to do a lot of, uh, host a lot of readings um, especially of writers coming through. When I first started writing poetry um, in the late 90s, and I'm wearing a dress over pants in honor of the late 90s, um, <laughs> I realized today, it's like, hmm, this seems very 20th century. So um, I couldn't get my you know, outfit together or anything, but um, you know, the Twin Cities was a different place for poetry and through the work of a lot of people, including people like David Mura and writer David Lawrence Grant and a lot of people in here, um, it's really just um, a beautiful place to be a poet now. So thank you everyone for being part of that. Um, and Poetry Asylum was started by uh, a fellow Korean immigrant poet, uh, Su Huang. It's also one of my roommates. And um, our three principles for Poetry Asylum, like, oh, is what would be a good, is, is this event or this person or this, you know, um, activity a good fit for our little two-person um, enterprise, you know, is these three kind of principles that no one is illegal. Uh, we started this during the last presidential administration, and all language is political, and poetry is a human right. So I just feel like all, um, all of the work that I try to do kind of falls under that, uh, that umbrella or that inter those intersections. So I'll read a few poems from the What Hex. Um, thank you to Coffee House Press for believing in my very strange work for many years. Um, I'll read you the first three, there's two epigraphs and then a little definition that um, provide sort of an overview of what I was trying to think about through these poems. So the first epigraph is um, by the Chamorro poet, uh, indigenous poet Craig Santos Perez, and it's from his poem, Halloween in the Anthropocene 2015, and it's just an excerpt. Praise our mothers of lost habitats, mothers of fallout, mothers of extinction. Pray for us, because even tomorrow will be haunted. Leave them, leave us, leave. And then the second epigraph is from Numbers 523, the King James Version of the Bible. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water and he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. And then the last is a definition of the word hex or um, an et etymology. Hex meaning magic spell was first recorded in 1909. Earlier it meant witch, see hag, meaning repulsive old woman, probably from Old English, hagtis, hagtas, witch, sorceress, enchantress, fury. It is a word that has no male cognate. Okay, 
Here, I'll read the poem that the title comes from. And this is um, an abecedarian, so the first word of each line begins with the word of letter of the alphabet in order. So it's called An Orphan Receives Her Commercial DNA Test Results from Two Companies, an Abecedarian. So it refers to, I, I did a 23andMe test first, it might be, it might be, I don't know, eight years ago, eight, seven years ago, and then um, a family ancestry.com test a little bit later, so. Ancestry laid upon a curse, a jinx, blood, and the other thing molten, reveries of my face, the facade behind my face. Called to account the countries, deviations of echolocations, dead, mine, dark detained, ever banked in an ethnographic afterlife. Fell, deep sleep postponing my rewrite, rotate, mutate, genes to be circumnavigated by spit-polished explorers. How is a child's globe a work of colonial conditioning? In this condition, the what hex in miniature jumps from gene sequence to succession. Pattern recognition, kinship, failing upriver, descent. Life maps itself in vials sent via the real mail, archaic method, homesick for the gold horses of its origins. Never miscalculate genealogicals, disruptions, inability. Orphan your ancestors in the underworld. Above, who tends graves, pours the prayer of soju when the dead need music. Shall this be our final quarry, silent as a doe and daughter? Reading the light, sowing a shade, a haunting. Sold to a centrifuge, the sterile shine of its exposed aperture. Now travel to the Neanderthal, witness the heavy brow boned branch, fork, and break. Our dead underestimate us, time machines drifting at the rate of future's arrival. Venn diagrams of past and speculation. Where will we repose? Collected, finger and jawbone, dusted dictionary, xenomorph, alien self, foreign. You, incarnate in the disciplined nation of the contemporaneous, stranger, zealous for the sweet peace of the unborn, as yet unburied. Thank you. I like alphabet poems or poems with numbers because then I can tell people you'll know when it ends. <laughs> and so you won't be in this just sort of poetry purgatory of like, what's happening? When is it over? Um, I like for people to know. <laughs> um, I, it's just, it's like my Catholic training. You go to mass, the mass, it's, it's the same, right? Every Sunday, the same. Every, you know, sacred calendar, the, the, the play is going to be the same as the one last year. And, you know, um, and my family chose a Catholic church that its mass was like 44 minutes and, and no more, you know, every Sunday. Um, even though it was a little bit further away from our house than the other Catholic church that most of their, you know, my mom's side went to, um, which, you know, was like a 60, at least 60 minutes. So every minute counts um, <laughs> is what I learned <laughs> when people are in front of a microphone. So. Um, okay, I will, I'll read these, these other two. There's, um, a lot of these poems are really kind of about, you know, i just, I write about the family a lot, but sort of an archetypal family. Um, you know, most people who've come to a, a reading or know me as a teacher or something, you know, I talk about adoption a lot. I was adopted from South Korea. And I'm at the height in the 70s, in the height of, of the Korean adoption you know, industry. And so this kind of archetypal family um, that transcends time and place. Also, like fairy tales show up a lot in my work. And then um, my dad started kind of his, his active dying process in uh, 2016 and then died in February of 2017. 
uh, when I was working on this book. So a lot of the poems just have that, have his, um, yeah, have that relationship in it, have his, have considerations of his end of life um, and his life and the afterlife. And I've been saying at readings that this book is, it, out of, it's my fourth book of poems and um, it's kind of the one that felt like I had, I had the hardest time getting a handle on it. Like, what is this about? And then and just in the past, um, maybe a few months, I realized, oh, well, it's about what our ancestors ask, are asking of us, I think. Um, and I think about my dad a lot. And I, I think about, um, I just always think he's going to show up. Or like, sometimes I just think, oh, I should just call him, you know, um, on the spirit phone. And like, we did not get along. You know, we did not get along for a long time. Um, even though I'm extremely easy to get along with. <laughs> um, so, you know, but um, I, I was really happy to, you know, that we kind of reconciled and everything. Anyway, so this is kind of one of those poems that has these archetypal uh, characters called History of Domestication. Child, put your name in a hat or a volcano. Your sense of time is inadequate. Maiden, while I sleep, my secret face faces the other way. Grief is a heated iron comb. Wife, the kerosene of grief. It doesn't age well. It degrades. Grief is a kind of time. Mother, sign your name. Become a series of signals. Holes punched through a rag. Make a space to look through. Your eye is a hole, too. Your iris constricts a telegraphy of the future. Elder, strange deliveries. The midwifery of anything here. Trade this hide for sod. Yesterday, at night, I dream of an infant made of flower and heat. We dream of the castaway wind inside us. Today, at night, my throat dresses itself in jewel green feathers. It does, you do. This is how an animal knows where she ends and you begin. I heard your mother asked you, where are the edges of your body? You replied, Jump rope is a cable of howl. We read that the rope is not a lead, but a whip. You saw that a crop scoops the air out of space. Space flogs the air and styles it a beggar. How the parabola arcs into geometry around the body. When the arithmetic is a kindness and not a rectangle to be buried in. When the rope is a dragon or a divining rod. Translucent tables below us and the yellow diamond snakes beneath. A world on its cable swinging, find in our minds the mushrooms, how they grow clandestine reveries. My dream fills your body like smoke. We have stored the lungs of the extinct in blue jars, hung them like Chinese lanterns. Rupture into spores and lash the world to the evolution of decay. Your jump line to moor everything to the beginning, the mares of the moon and more to fall into. See the row of old pins haunting the machines. Hold our noise fast to every threshold. This poem, um, this, I should have written this on here, but maybe I also I'm kind of worried about like, not embarrassing other poets, but you know how you might say, oh, this poem is um, for this other such and such poet. And so I feel like this poem is for Ilya Kaminsky, but he, you know, you don't want to give someone something they, they don't want. Like, I don't know him. He doesn't know me. I don't know if he would think like, don't, you know, dedicate that poem to me. It's terrible. Um, but, um, you know, wonderful poet, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but so there's kind of a hand symbol in it. Um, it's just a triangle, but I'll read this. It's called An Orphan Considers the Hand of God. Oh, one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's, got, it's in seven quatrains, so you won't be in that poetry purgatory. You'll kind of know. Well, you won't know, because you don't know how long. It could be really, you know, like really long lines. So, okay, wait. Oh, this is just like, it's just about, you know, pain minimization at poetry readings. Okay, an orphan considers the hand of God. Mistaken for an iron spear, a copper shield, the hands make a triangle, symbol of a great house, or an ark low in the water, or a risen fire smoke in the distance. How did God make his hands small enough to form the faces of so many soldiers? How did he concoct my family from rope or broth? A child can be renamed a thousand times or denied the dignity altogether. Die without one, live without one. A nightmare, the palest of milk-white horses, the mother of all horses pays me a visit. She offers me a blacksmith to be or to marry. Tongs, rings, hammer, anvil, forge. She promises me my true name, knows my ancestors, speaks their tongue. Do not trust the centaur, half man, half beast. He's cunning as he has to be, a cursed creature, pretending to be the last of his kind for pity and poor lodging. Always the blinding bright hand of God says no. God says I belong everywhere, you belong nowhere. Countries are made for the named. Look at your identification papers, look. Fires burn, feed on the names of the renamed. The golden threads of our ancestors make a ball of snakes. Births of thousands in lightless, hungry places where names are expensive, where gods are for the rich. Night is my mother. She wears many faces, has seen the glittering hand of God. She pulls silver from the sky, names from the sea like fish. There is enough, there is enough, there's never enough. So um, I blame my church uh, that I grew up going to um, for being a poet and you know English teacher, and I'm sure they don't want that um, burden. But you know the one. It reminds me when I read this poem that my my editor was like, "Well, do you want to capitalize?" his, because you do in some places and not in others, right? Because in Christianity, you capitalize, um, or maybe, all, yeah, um, you capitalize the gendered pronouns when you refer to the male deities. Um, and so anyway, I decided against it because it's not, the poems aren't really about a deity. They're not, you know, um, someone said at some point, Sometimes, yeah, like your relationship with God is your relationship to authority. And so that's something that I think about a lot. Um, the, like God just comes into the poems unbidden, unwelcomed. <laughs> um, you know, like it's like the bad Ouija board that you shouldn't play with, right? Like it's, um, it's, not, it's not like, wow, this is going to be a bestseller. <laughs> Let me just <laughs> throw in a lot of... Um, references to God in these poems uh, and nothing against writing about God but at, you know I'm just trying to explain myself and just making it worse I'll just carry on carry on with the poetry um, but that's the you know that's the politicization of language and and you know also the the gendered aspect um, of English and, and other languages okay so I've got a lot of poems too that are sort of about um, uh, like museum culture and colonial culture of uh, material collecting, preserving, ca cataloging, displaying, um, kind of this, the, uh, the sort of mortuary aspect of museums. And one of the things that I was doing during the writing of this book was I was a, a, a Gates fellow at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Mia, um, in the Asian art wing and was trying to plan some activations and just doing some uh, office there for a summer and just doing some thinking and being a poet in residence. And, you know, the thing that 
you, you can't help but notice right away in the Asian art wing um, is that so many of the objects are grave goods. And the provenance of, you know, the, the, the panels are all, you know, so-and-so, you know, lumber baron <laughs> donated this or um, it's on loan from, you know, so-and-so mineral person. Um, one of the, you know, wealthy collecting families. Maybe someone's here. In that case, let's be friends. <laughs> really <laughs> um, need rich friends. Um, but just thinking, right, like, these are people's, ancestors, these were people, these were people who were buried with things, oftentimes also, you know, wealthy um, people of the aristocracy who could afford to have things, who could afford to have things buried with them. Um, so I was just thinking a lot about how much of that wasn't really part of the discourse on the surface of these displays. Um, and then, yeah, as a non-Western, origin person thinking too about just the West's um, fetishization of, of other art, um, animals from outside of, of Europe, uh, North America. And so some of these are, are about that um, and about our, yeah, our culture around, kind of the cultures of longing around um, how things like taxidermy and museums, um, what we're trying, what are we trying to, what are we trying to um, hold on to, what are we trying to honor, what are we trying to transcend. Mm. Okay, so this is called detonations. If pain makes the body turn to cold flame, if scars are the photo negatives of suitable decisions, I don't know what those would be, so if anyone knows, let me know after. Um, I wrote letter after letter to the bomb maker. I attended the bomb maker's annual ball, shawls of white grass and waste and fury. The earth spits its teeth at us. Giant mechanical hummingbirds fight over all the sugar. The Koreans scab the Japanese in the sweet cane fields. Modernity is a rust factory, the hard soft binary. Exoskeletons make war even harder, make our bodies insects and we are home. Lay down your lances. All you horses sleep next to your wildness, you are the shadow. Ghosts, cocktails, moonlight, foxfire to read by. Everywhere, not libraries of the body. War, the night, show, the day, show, the violins, the rubble, the child, burials, the blood, hearts, the red stop signs, the graves in the air, your black or blackened hair. This one is titled Bayonets and Bonfire. Of all the things that could be fixed to the end of a rifle, for example, the face of your enemy as a child, a prayer, tomorrow, the fantastic shapes of death and all the plunges over, into, through, after I weigh each mask and polish and oil, the better to see the mass grave in front of us, I would like to touch every face none exactly the same, not exactly. I gave blood today exactly the same as yesterday. Death rejected me another day, his train car full of astonished faces, the road to hell an archipelago of the dumbfounded and bewildered. Arms, the man, the man, the arms. A bayonet can also refer to a man armed with a bayonet. Birds on the road, birds to pluck your eye, like a ripe cherry, the stone, the pit of you, fruit dreams within you, fossils in the cutaways. The siege, the soldier, the stab, the gallop, the priest and his magic oil. Specimens of immortality. Baroque elaborations and tableau of the dodo white morning doves suspended by invisible wire. 
it's it's so it's so um it's so strange to you know be living in this time of extinction but having grown up in a different time um and i think about the dodo you know that i grew up maybe there seemed like oh well there were a couple of extinct animals you know that were in kind of cultural circulation the dodo the the um carrier pigeon, you know, um, and then it's like before that mm, time, 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 you know, and the dinosaurs. And now, you know, my, we, my children, um, any future, you know, descendants are living through this other, this other time. All the rabbits wear turtle shell helmets and face the sunrise as an army of sweet. Sentinels everywhere, hidden bones like flutes of wire. Perpetual alert to the guards of the necropolis. You are the largest of the lionesses with an assortment of cubs that died before you were born. The birth of death. Seedless grapes sown in the vineyard. Museum guard cultivars of boredom. The gore, the charge, the wall of horns. Eyes ever last the horizon, prey or predator. Frees us in the hunt, in the rut, in the reliefless past. Your beauty is made mostly of proteins. Astringent portraiture, salts and cures and trophy. Trophy with concealed bullet wounds. The soft solace of killing. The school of beauty saved from the burning. Sightless zoo, breathless savanna, glass forest. Dioramas of longing. Big game hunter, the new world, the safari. The feral, the wild, the stampede, the old, the lame, the wounded, the wolf and the lamb lie together at the end of the world. My horns ground to medicine, my blood blown into glass. Gosh, she's conscious. Okay, four, three, eight. Um, Lisa, are we doing a discussion, little discussion? Yeah. Do you want to do that? Okay. Um, but instead of a Q&A, it's always like questions and more questions, you know, like <laughs> questions and questions, or I'll ask you questions and you can <laughs> give me answers, or questions and advice. That would be good. I need, I need your advice today. Okay. Um, I wandered into a mass extinction event before I knew what was happening. I renounced my humanity in an attempt to escape the fate of my betters and strangers. The floods gathered up the last of the patients in small cork boats that fell from the sky, like leaves from a maple tree in autumn's last exhalation. What was everything I could sacrifice for a Soya's spacesuit, something worn in and vacuum tested? Just give me a sign, I said, cursing the gods and demons of my forefathers. With the helmet's face shield down, I had difficulty panning gold from the rivers of Colorado, but I said I will prevail. The bracelets and anklets I made with the metal chinkled and chankled, and I, caparisoned like a fine knight's horse, encouraged my prancing and unyielding vanity. I wrote obituary after homage, after ode, after elegy, for every species larger than my thumb. The flora and fauna care nothing for the world of letters. The trees recoiled at the cannibalism of paper. I buried every book deep, so deep a place, a place without the language of signs. Okay, I'll read, I'll read two more. Um, poets are always joking, like looking for a happy poem. <laughs> like, <laughs> just I'm, I'm almost there. I swear. Um, okay, this I'll read these two. Um, Ravishing migrations. Invisible hands built a fleet of ships to rival the Japanese, the Persians, the British Navy. Sightless eyes fashion cannons and point them unerringly toward the enemy. 
The enemy in watery stereo sound like dolphins, like whales, like the names of generals. The enemy in the black sky and below the blue ground. Secret tunnels, warrens of the young, the chain of command, the tanks and the bombs. Walk over this earth so smooth of basalt. Walk through this wall for treasure, pull your ancestors through the eye of a needle. Strap the child to your back and your shamans rattle the last cry. Leave the child that is no longer your child but the ground's child. Like a stone, bury the body. Watch how a stone drinks rain as if parched. Watch how a stone grows moss like hair. Make a cairn of children and listen to their gossip. Watch them pretend to be alive. Look into their pitted eyes and close them with a song. Leave the song there and move your feet over the land. Break it down and leave it everywhere until you have nothing until you leave your name behind because it is so heavy and you are so very light. Okay, this will be my last poem. So think of your, your answers to my questions. <laughs> Transit from lintel to lintel. Travelers, wipe the blood off your shoes. Lay low with lambs. A blue accordion of white weather. Whether bird night nor black-eyed morning, hoop of horizon beneath, a sum, a transit, angle of repose, old marine permanently under dusk, sky a gold hoard, light road. Nerves customize the nightfall garden, nocturnal collegium of snakes, your sovereign branding. Your reveries with a gilded hoof, you kick like a mule, clandestine bit and bridle, Drowned tongue and underground tide, slant rhyming chants of the children, building, hiding, sorting, sparing, command, approach, ride, and rider. Thank you so much. Yes. When I write in the first person, does it flow more smoothly? Oh, that's a great question. I, I'd say no. I'm often trying to weasel out of the first person and avoid the first person. Um, and I feel more comfortable writing in the second person or the first person plural. Um, so sometimes even if I'm, I've written something in first person, even if I'm reading it, I'll, I'll change it to second person. Um, because once I'm reading it out loud, it feels like vain or irrelevant. Yeah, so I prefer to write about... I, I enjoy yeah. listening to your voice. Thank you. Um, but the, but the, to the first person, it seemed to flow more smoothly. Mm. Oh my gosh, um, like take notes. Maybe to my, my ears. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, um, mm -hmm. uh, so, sometimes you quite de deliberately write in the second person. Or, and occasionally those the narrator. Mm -hmm. It might be that you know if I'm writing the first person, there might be like more sentences, like complete sentences with, with there might be more a little more narrative, um, and so in that sense maybe, yeah maybe it feels like there's a little more um, coherence in a way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your reading. Um, uh, so in, in one of your earlier poems, you said that, um, I'm trying to remember the line, like bury the name, take the name out of a hat or put the name in a hat or in a volcano. And then in another poem, you talked about um, a man with the bayonet is also called a bayonet. And I just see this like theme throughout your work of like naming. And I was wondering if you could like speak to like what seems like this magical and or violent act of naming that like, 
is interweaved, even with your epi epigram, epitaph, whatever, uh, with with, with the, the verse from King James, right? You're, you're really playing around with magic and violence and naming, and I'd just love to hear you speak more to that. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I think a lot of, you know, the, the naming too, so much is about, for me, is about gender, and I think about that line with the, vo the hat, the name in the hat and the name in the volcano. I think about like the, the, the kind of archetype of like sacrificing the virgin to the volcano or the monster or to, to this ocean or, or something um, vast and, and catastrophic, you know, and that also seems like just what we do to, um, I mean, to everybody in this culture, but, um, especially in terms of gender. Um, so yeah, thank you for noticing that. And then, I mean, for me personally, I've had multiple names, I've been multiply named in my life and most adoptees have been renamed, um, you know, at least once. And then women are uh, in, you know, patrilineal cultures are either taking their father's last name or are expected to or conventionally take you know, if they um, marry a man, taking their last name. And then, you know, even, even though I didn't do that and, and my two children have a, have a dual name, um, most of my, you know, female identified and assigned female at birth, people who have uh, reproduced with a male identified person, most of them, most of their children have their partner, male partner's name. And kind of, it kind of like went without question. And a lot of times it was uh, the woman in the partnership saying like, well, I don't care about my last name, it's my dad's last name. And you know, he's a jerk or, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and so I'm, I've always been really obsessed with names because it's always for me been, you know, a marker of assimilation, a marker of, an Anglophone culture, you know. Um, when I came to the U.S., I was speaking like toddler Korean, and then you just lo you lose it right away, and you take on whatever the language. You know, I just learned English right away, and so, um, you know, and all words are names of things. And I, I just someone wise, maybe many people said, you know, every word is an anthology, and every word is a history, right, or a library. It just contains so much of the human activity that, that why we needed that word, why someone needed that word. And so out of desire or, or, or um, longing to conjure just something out of, out of nothing. Yeah, so names are really important to me and, but they also just feel like just, just languaging, you know. Um, but certainly from a political standpoint, you know, when you're an immigrant or you're a naturalized citizen or you're a stateless person somewhere, um, or you have a name that is uh, difficult for those in the majority, right? You're just constantly being reminded, usually on a daily, multiply, multiply on a daily basis, I'm reminded that I'm not in my home culture, you know, um, because I chose to re, uh, to take up my, my Korean name. Um, so to me, it's, yeah, there's these, all these American ideas, um, or any kind of polycultural um, dynamics of cultural exchange, of you know conquest, of absorption. Um, I was just reading in the New Yorker today. A, a, a long piece of uh, journalism came out on the aftermath of adoption that focused on uh, adoptee perspectives, and one of the women who's a real you know, really wonderful activist and writer, Angela Tucker, an African-American woman, and was adopted into a white family, and I think she's about my age. We were both, well, I think she was born in the 70s, too. The 70s, like I was born in 71, two, three, four, five, you know, like, no, like specifically 1974. Um, but yeah, in that, that era of adoption, even though she's a domestic adoptee, but she's trying to find her birth parents and you know she uh, she found out the name of her birth mother was Deborah Johnson but there were literally tens of thousands of Deborah Johnsons I mean because of you know enslaved captivity the captivity industry um, 
in the South and plantations and white owning people named Johnson. You know, so it even that made like she there's no escape from right the naming um, and what those mean and how it makes things difficult for some, more difficult for some people um, to find yeah find out what they to be yeah to be un to be to be as free as they can be. Thank We're going to take an online question. Is there one? No online questions okay. yet. Then we How won't. dare they? Then we won't. Don't they Maybe want to be they part will now. of this? Question, and, and you'll get a chance to Okay, good. <laughs> you know, as we're listening to you uh, read your poems, there's a, con you know, I feel a consistency in the sort of brilliant metaphoric language, the lyricism, a, a certain thematic concerns. But also, you know, when you look at the book itself, there's a lot of different formal things going on. And I wonder wh how that process works for you and what the influences are. I mean, you have graphics, you have you know, visual things, you have different arrangements of words on the page, you, you, you sometimes have the typography sort of whitened out, and it's like, how did you develop this aesthetic? Where does it come from? And where in the process of writing the poem does that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that question. It usually happens pretty early on, and I've been wondering too, you know, maybe this is like a question, and maybe I can get the answer. You know, is it because I don't trust the words themselves enough, right? Like, am I trying to over-accessorize? Um, you know, is it like, yeah, is it like too many outfits? Um, because the language itself is more, you know, more than enough. Like, we could just be just completely, we could be completely drunk on just a few words, like in their, you know, most... Um, essential being, I think. Um, but I, th I th think that, I don't know if it's from just being exposed to a lot of different kinds of languages um, as a kid. I don't know if it's from teaching high school for so many years and like just trying to like do any kind of circus trick to keep people's, you know, your students' attention, try to like give them something that they can use and deliver it in, you know, um, some kind of palatable way. I don't know, because it's, it's not, I wish that I could write like the elegant book that is just one form, right? Um, I'm, I'm for sure watched too much TV as a kid. Like, so is it just like this tension span thing of a child of the 80s? Like I did, you know, didn't grow up in. Like I'm teaching Beowulf to my college students for the second semester in a row. And, um, they really like it. It's just a great, it's just a great adventure story. But um, you know, we don't live in that culture, and I didn't grow up in that culture of memorizing things or you know um, having more of an uh, an oral culture, maybe in church and things like that. You know, but. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I wish, I feel like it's, um, yeah, it's part of my aesthetic to be like, kind of like tacky, like like how Dolly Parton says, like, it's expensive to look this cheap kind of thing. Like, you know, that there's nothing wrong with having tacky poetry. Like, why not have just a lot of, um, yeah, why not just have gaudy poetry too? Like, maybe that's part of being, you know, growing up in, in like a working class family and um, a lot of, you know, when you can't afford a lot of things, maybe you like, it's like, well, you can't afford like a well-tailored dress that's the right size. Or I just felt like growing up, everything was either like too small, too big, or, you know, like you're just always kind of not dressed exactly right for the occasion. You just, you're always kind of out of time with, you know, because your frugal mother's like, you need to buy the shoes two sizes too big because you'll be growing out of them. And, you know, just like nothing, it's just awkward. And so maybe that's part of the poetry aesthetic too. Like, I don't trust things that are too elegant. Um, I'm not that way. You know, I'm a, you know, 
yeah, like tacky, messy person, like maybe poetry, that's okay too. I, I, it's, not, it's not a choice. Like I, I, wish that, I wish that I was a different kind of poet in some ways. Um, but that's how it's coming out. Thank you. Time for one more, one last question. Anybody? Thank you. I um, heard a lot of concern with time and the kind of increasing yeah. pace like of extinction, for example. And um, this maybe segues from what you were just saying about um, interactions with students. I'm just I'm, I'm an English teacher also, and I'm curious about um, whether you feel like with your teaching poetry with your students, you're, if you're working against the kind of increasing pace and abundance of technology and um, input and mm -hmm. kind of how you in your own work or in the work that you're teaching um, find that slowed pace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. I mean, definitely. And I more and, you know, more and more feel like I need to retire. Like I'm way too, you know, crabby about everything. But I mean, I was, you know, I think crabby before when I was a young teacher. So but I don't know. Actually, my students are so, they're so, um, I think they really, because the hue, like, we haven't changed, right? Like, some from since the time that we were, you know, kicking it with the Neanderthals and, like, you know, absorbed them. Um, we're the same humans. We're the same beings. And so I, I feel like in my teaching, you know, 20 years of teaching, that students really are the same, especially when it comes to poetry or story or theater. I mean, that once you give them a supportive container and kind of the permission and set things up well, and that, you know, just depends on where the students are and what's going on. Um, they just really, like, we all just really enjoy having a slow down space, right, to, um, because it's, you know, like our hearts aren't beating any faster. Our, meta you know, I mean, they, if they are, that's not good, but like it's the same, we ha the same kinds of rhythms of the ocean and all of the things we're just, you know, I like to talk about a lot that we're just mostly water. Um, and so that hasn't changed. And so I try to not get caught up in, um, I mean, I do, but when I'm really listening to them and what they find meaningful, it seems the same, but it is a lot of work to set up the right conditions because they're, you know, their lives are really stressful and they're certainly, um, yeah, it just seems like it's our job to, you know, put a barrier around all the things that are trying to steal their spirits all the time, you know, but it, to me, it seems like the true, once once we can get to that like quieter place, it seems the same, but it's tough. Um, yeah, it's, thank you, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emilius. It's the awkward, it's the awkward part where I shoo the the guest out of the way because I should like should I hold on to the mic good afternoon I think yeah it's still afternoon late afternoon uh, for those who are attending who are attending their first friends of the library event uh, this year my name is Amelius White and I'm currently the chair of the friends of the library this is the last time I get to say that at an event uh, since my term is going to come to an end this summer but it's been an honor for me to serve in this in this role uh, in part because it allows me to play a small part in supporting uh, what I think are uh, uh, one of our states and the university's treasures, which is our university library. So uh, I'm very glad to do that. Uh, in addition to having great libraries, we have great leadership at our libraries, including our dean, uh, Lisa German, and great staff and librarians, uh, including some who retire and still support the library. So thank you uh, to Marcia Pancake. Um, so a sincere thank you to all of you who work to support the libraries. Your support is very important. So on Sunday, I started reading a book called It's a Good Time for Truth, uh, Race in Minnesota. And I didn't notice the name of the 
editor of this book until I was until I was reading the introduction, and you know I was reading the book because it was next on my it was it was it was next on my list, and then I saw that it was edited by a person named Sung Young Shen. I was like, really? Uh, who's our our guest today? And so I think it was fate that that book came up on my on my reading list, and I took it out of the the pile. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Sung Young Shen for honoring us by sharing her great poetry and her unique perspective, as well as a sense of humor. Uh, this is a hard day for you and your family, so I very much appreciate you being here. When I, I always say when I come to a Friends Forum event, I expect to leave knowing more than I did when I arrived, and that's the case here. I did not know there was a name for alphabet poems, and I didn't know that was an actual thing, uh, but now, now I do. Uh, but also, the, I'm going to sit with that question that you, you mentioned when you were reading some of your poems about what your ancestors, what our ancestors are asking of us. Uh, I think about my ancestors a lot, and because uh, as I get to do things that I'm sure they didn't think I'd get to do, but I think that question about what they're asking of us, I think, is, is, is important. Uh, I would also like to thank you for being an editor for, uh, for A Good Time for Truth. Uh, it's an important book. And although I am only a few essays in, ironically, there's a lot of irony and fate today, the essay I'm on right now was written by one David Mura, who was, uh, in addition to sitting here up in the front, was last year's Pancake Poetry uh, speaker. So uh, there's that. But I highly recommend the book if you, if you have not uh, picked it up. Uh, but thank you for your presence. Thank you for your contributions as a, as a poet, a writer, and as a thoughtful member of our of our community. How many of you are here at a friend's event for the first time? So thank you to, to, for giving us a shot. Hopefully you'll, you'll come back at another time. Uh, how many of you have attended other friend's events this, year's, this year? All right, a lot of hands. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, today's event and the four other friend's events that were, have been presented since October and scores of friend's events that have been presented over the last couple of years would not be possible without a few groups of people, starting with the Friends of the Library's board. Uh, we have several current board members here, as well as former board members, and we can't put on these events without the, the time, talent, uh, and creativity of our, of our board members. So I want to thank all of them, those who are here, current and former, for their uh, continued support for, for the Friends. We also could not host our events as friends without the great staff that we have in the libraries. Uh, particularly, I'd like to thank uh, Mark and Linnea, as well as others throughout the year who helped to make these events possible. The Friends events are offered under the umbrella Friends Forum, a series for curious minds. These events would not be possible without the financial support of Friends of the Library. So if you are a member of the Friends, thank you very much for your generous support of the Friends in the Libraries. If you are not a member, uh, I humbly ask that you consider joining and becoming one. Depending on your, your level of support, being a friend of the libraries comes with library borrowing privileges, uh, in addition to be able to support events like these. These events in the aggregate provide opportunities for learning, for increasing our understanding of the lived experiences for, of others, for uh, gaining a deeper awareness of our great collections in the libraries, and if nothing else, to be entertained. You'll find out information more about the Friends on the library's news website, and there may be some handouts out in the, the foyer. So thanks to everyone for attending today, whether you are here in person or online. For those online, enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, and to those who are in person, please join us uh, for a book signing and refreshments in the foyer. I know I called you an atrium earlier. I'm not sure what it is officially, but <laughs> it's, there's a space out there where there will be a book signing and food. Uh, and to everyone, stay safe well and hopeful, and hope to see you in the fall. Thanks.